ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and privilege to introduce on behalf of the board of the SOE our next uh, keynote lecturer, Bertel D'Amato. Bertel D'Amato uh, is a Maltese. He was born in Malta, but his mother was from Sweden. Um, Bertel D'Amato had his undergraduate training in Malta, uh, and then he moved to the UK, to Scotland, where he made his residency and specialized in ophthalmic oncology. He worked in uh, Glasgow until 1993, where I had the privilege to meet him in 1990. At that time was the last year of his mentor, Wallace Fowles, Professor Fowles, who retired and then uh, Bertel took over the oncology service. In 1993, he moved to Liverpool. He established there the very big ophthalmic oncology service, just in the middle of the UK, next to the Clatterbridge proton beam facility. And he had the unique opportunity to unite different modalities of treatment, both in anterior and posterior tumors in adults. So his uh, focus has been for the last at least 30 years, treatment of adults, adult tumors on the surface of the eye and especially intraocularly. It was my privilege to know, to having, getting to know to, uh, Bertel for almost 30 years and uh, he is an ex extremely active uh, teacher, mentor and collaborator. Uh, he has been the president of various societies of the Ocular, uh, European uh, Ocular Oncology Society uh, and was participating in founding it. Also in the International Society of Ocular Oncology. And uh, a few years ago he moved to San Francisco to run the ophthalmic oncology service there. And I'm privileged and happy that we have you here, Berto, and I would like to ask you to give your keynote lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. It's a great privilege for me to be giving this uh, keynote lecture today. Uh, when I was... Um, well, uh, pr pr when uh, Professor Betrakis proposed the title of this talk, I thought that uh, it would be very instructive not only to describe what we're doing today, but how to, to describe how everything has changed and developed since I started working in ocular oncology 33 years ago. And hopefully I'll have time also to say a few words about how I, I imagine that things might progress in the next few years. The first thing that happened to me, you know, I entered Ocular Oncology to save lives, and one of the first things that happened to me was that I was accused of being a murderer, murdering my patients. And the accuser was Professor Manshot. He was a, a pathologist. And when he examined the nucleated eyes under the microscope, he saw what appeared to be viable melanoma cells. And so he concluded that radiotherapy was an unjustifiable experiment, unethical, and we should all be enucleating all our patients, all eyes with severe melanoma. At the same time, Professor Zimmerman was saying that enucleation was accelerating metastatic death by the physical trauma during the operation. And he based this hypothesis on a peak in the mortality in the second post-operative year. So all sorts of procedures were developed to prevent disseminating tumor cells, and we were advising patients not to rub their eye, and the nucleation was done as an emergency. But then the collaborative ocular melanoma study did a randomized study comparing enucleation alone with enucleation with pre-enucleation radiotherapy, and they concluded that there was no difference, so that the operation was not disseminating tumor cells. And they also compared uh, 
enucleation with plaque radiotherapy, and again, they concluded there was no difference, so that plaque treatment radiotherapy was as safe and effective as enucleation. But Professor Manshot, Eskalen, and others did uh, studies on the tumor cell doubling times, and they concluded that from the time the tumor escapes from the eye, it takes eight years to kill the patient. You need so what this means is that in the study of the collaborative ocular melanoma study, they did very careful power calculations, but you cannot prevent what has already happened. So if the tumor has already spread from the eye, you cannot prevent it from killing the patient by doing anything to the eye. So if they had eliminated all the patients who died within the eight post-operative years, they would have left, been left with very few patients. So these studies were statistically inconclusive. However, they were very influential. When I started in ocular oncology, you had to have a good reason not to enucleate the eye. The other eye had to be blind. And after that, you had, a good, you had to have a good reason to enucleate the eye and not to try to save the eye. So this stimulated a lot of um, interest in eye-conserving treatments. One of these was laser treatment. At first, we used to give, treat with photocoagulation with short, high-intensity flashes of strong light. But if the light wasn't strong enough, you, get rec you got recurrence. If it was too strong, you got retinal traction, neovascular membranes, fibrosis, in this case causing lens subluxation. It was a very dangerous treatment. And then Professor Folds and I did a study developing low intensity, long duration burns with a Krypton laser, each burn lasting one minute, but low intensity. And um, Yendo Oosterhaus in the Netherlands refined that with the infrared laser and the and it's become a very much safer, a much more effective form of treatment. In the 1980s, we also tried photodynamic therapy with, vert with hematoporphyrin derivative, but our patients got terribly sunburned in Glasgow in winter when there was no sun, so we abandoned that treatment. And now we have vertoporphyrin treatment, which is effective in some patients without all the terrible side effects. In future, there's already studies on intravitreal injections with nanoparticles, and that might well, well, it'll be interesting to see whether those treatments work. Most patients are treated with brachytherapy using a radioactive plaque that is sutured to the surface of the eye and left there for a few days until you get the correct dose of radiation in the tumor. In Europe, the most popular plaque is the ruthenium plaque that gives beta radiation with a short range. And when I started, I followed conventional practice with a two millimeter safety margin all around the tumor, but that increased the risk of optic neuropathy and maculopathy. And over the years, I learned how to place the plaque eccentrically with the edge of the plaque at the edge of the tumor, no physical safety margin. And I developed a template to do this and a system for in indirect ophthalmoscopy, transillumination, looking at the sunset sign, which meant the template was in the correct place. But the greatest, for me at least, the greatest uh, advance was a simple little trick because in those days we were so afraid of causing diplopia when we disinserted the muscle that we tried not to disinsert the muscle and that caused lots of it was very difficult to place the plaque accurately. And then one day, I, it occurred to me that if I measured the knot to limbus distance before just inserting the muscle, and then when I put the muscle back, I have the same knot to li distance, limbus distance, uh, it, it eliminated all the problem of diplopia. We could disinsert the muscles. The operation was much easier, much safer, and much more reliable. Here's a patient I treated with an eccentric plaque in 1986, and a few years ago, when we phoned her, she was still doing very well. So, and here's another patient with a juxtaphobial tumor, with, and, and uh, just a few months ago, 
uh, she still had excellent vision many years after her treatment. And you don't get more recurrences because once the plaque is eccentric, you can increase the dose of radiation and that reduces the recurrence rate. In the United States and a few other places, the iodine plaque is much more popular and that gives gamma radiation with a, a wide, with a long range so you can treat big tumors. But in, in the 1980s, the radiation was not collimated. So the radiation went all over the place. You got a lot of collateral damage to optic nerve and fovea. Now, the plaques have been redesigned so that the, the radioactive implants are inside metal grooves so that the beam is collimated. And a few centers are using personalized plaques made with 3D printing. And that is a great advance in black plaque treatment. In the future, maybe we will be using uh, augmented reality where we can see through the sclera and see the tumor and the plaque and the isodose curves. And this is the kind of technology that's already being used with other surgery in brain surgery and so on. With regards to proton beam, you've got a, the cyclotron that bombards the tumor with um, protons, and when they stop moving, they emit radiation and kill the tumor. When I started, we were seeing lots of problems with the eyelid, the superior eyelid, because if the, that's irradiated, you get, you get squamous metaplasia of the palpable conjunctiva, keratinization, scratching of the cornea every time the patient blinks, and a big development was to treat through the closed eyelid, this transpalpable irradiation eliminated the problem. A lot of patients after radiotherapy, especially if they've got a big tumor, get a lot of exudation, macular edema, retinal detachment, rubiosis, neovascular glaucoma. And it used to be thought that all these problems occurred because of radiation of healthy tissues, normal tissues. And some people still believe that. And I still work with them. Uh, but several years ago, I had a patient, this patient, who got lots of exudates after plug treatment of a ciliary body tumor. And it looked as if they were coming from the tumor, so I, I removed the tumor, it was the obvious thing to do. And all the exudates disappeared. So that gave me the concept of the toxic tumor syndrome, what I call the toxic tumor syndrome. And that has greatly improved our management of a lot of radiation-induced complications. Previously, if we used to apply grid laser photocoagulation, but as you can see in this patient who was treated elsewhere, it, it didn't really work very well. Now, we give the laser direct to the tumor to shrivel away all the leaking vessels, and that's much more effective. Another advance has been the introduction of antiangiogenic factors, intravitreal injections of steroids as well. And here's a patient who responded very nicely to that treatment. But then when we stopped the Avastin, she developed these terrific exudates. What would you do? Well, we removed the tumor by endoresection, and the exudates all dried up. And here's another patient with a severe exudative retinal detachment after radiotherapy, remove the toxic tumor and the radiotherapy flattens. And here's a proof of principle kind of patient, a 75 year old man who had a big tumor in his left eye. It was his better seeing eye, he was amblyopic in the other eye. Normally I would do an enucleation or, or um, maybe a transclear resection but he had had a cerebrovascular accident and was an anticoagulant, so I treated him with proton beam. Unfortunately, he got severe retinal detachment, neovascularization, intraocular pressure of 50. So I did a exoresection. The retina was flat the next day. The rubiosis disappeared. And a few months later, he could even stop his anti-glaucoma medications, proving the concept of the toxic tumor syndrome. Prevention is better than cure, and here's a patient who had a big tumor in his better seeing eye, the other eye was amblyopic with vision of counting fingers, 
I knew if I gave radiotherapy, he would become totally blind. So he had a transclear local resection, exo resection, with a junctive plaque treatment, a bit of laser treatment, and I heard that a few months ago he still had vision of almost 20, 20, 6, 6, uh, 6 over 7.5. So exoresection uh, looks easy to do when you have a diagram like this, but in real life it's a very difficult operation and therefore not many people are, are doing this. So there's a very long learning curve before you can achieve these kinds of results. Um, Professor T Folds taught me how to do this operation when I was 31 and since then uh, there's been a lot of um, tips and tricks being discovered in a painful kind of way so that the results have improved. When I started, we were not giving an ad adjunctive radiotherapy, so I had a problem with recurrences. And so to overcome that problem, we uh, performed the excision with very wide safety margins, and the extensive surgery caused a lot of morbidity. But then with adjunctive plaque treatment, the recurrences almost disappeared, and because the surgical excision was much smaller, there was a smaller incidence, a lower incidence of complications. Another problem was that when we used to dissect the tumor, the retina used to bulge through the big scleral window, and you had to look through the retina and cut behind the tumor, and every now and then we moved the scissors in the wrong way and got a retinal tear, vitreous all over the place, lots of complications. And then we started doing uh, core vitrectomy to soften the eye so that the retina fell away from the tumor, making the surgery much easier and safer. Except that with some mushroom tumors, the retina was uh, stuck to the apex of the tumor. And previously, I used to try and do the dissection with blunt scissors. Logically, that's the thing to do. But one day I discovered by accident that if you instead use a sharp scalpel to separate the retina from the tumor, there's an invisible membrane that you can't see. And if you imagine where it is and you cut, the retina peels away and you get a better result. And in case you're wondering, this is how the patient did very well, just as well because he traveled all the way from Cuba to England for the operation. A big problem when we did cyclochorodectomy used to be um, retinal dialysis. And whatever we did, encircling strap, tamponade, nothing really worked. We had lots of problems with detachment. So one day it occurred to me that if we can preserve the ciliary epithelium in the pars plana, then we should not get a retinal dialysis. It took me many years to get that idea. But how do you preserve a, an epithelium that's only about two cells thick with big scissors and so on? Actually, it turned out to be much easier than I thought. Here's a little video showing how it's done. The trick is to go into the, through the choroid behind the aura serrata, posterior to serrata, where the retina is strong. And then with blunt scissors, you have to imagine where everything is, and you cut by blunt dissection, you separate the ciliary epithelium from the uvea, and like that, you can preserve it. But you need to have hypotension to lower the blood pressure, to prevent hemorrhage, and then you can see what you're doing, and it's much more controllable. We were very lucky. We had very good anesthetists. The most important people in the room was the anesthetist, were the anesthetists. We always laughed at their jokes, and they were very obliging to us. And here you can see the tumor separating from the retina. There's the intact pars plana ciliary epithelium. You can see it's still intact there. And that ha totally solved the problem of retinal dialysis and retinal detachment. There you go. So, another big um, development, at least in my experience. If you speak to 10 ocular oncologists, you'll have 10 different stories. This is my perspective. Was a rhidocyclectomy. Uh, the traditional way was to start at the front. You dilate the pupil, do a broad iridectomy, a rhidocyclectomy. But you're left with a big coloboma with lots of problems. One day it occurred to me that we're doing everything back to front. What we should do is start posteriorly, constrict the pupil with pilocarpine, 
then start the operation posteriorly, and like that, it's with a tense iris, it's much easier to, to conserve the sphincter and to get a much better result. We used to treat these patients with iris melanomas with um, surgical excision, and they had big problems with big coloboma and recurrences and so on. And one day I had a patient, uh, a lady about 30 years old, from, who worked in Antarctica, and she refused the iridectomy because of the bright light in Antarctica with the snow. She wouldn't be able to work there. So I said, well, we can try and treat this with proton beam radiotherapy. I've never heard of this being done before, but I, I can't see why it should not work. And so she gave me permission to try the proton beam radiotherapy, and it was so successful that we treated another patient and another patient, and now it's a standard treatment around the world. And here's a patient with an extensive iris melanoma who's done very well. Just recently in January, still had good vision after lens extraction, glaucoma, surgery, and so on, but is still doing well, much better than if it had uh, iridectomy. And here's a patient who had proton beam treatment of the entire anterior segment as far as the aura. And um, it's, it's usually effective, usually with few complications, although recently I had a patient in San Francisco who got stem cell deficiency. With juxtapapillary tumors, radiotherapy inevitably causes optic neuropathy, often with neovascular complications, lots of trouble. But here's a patient who had endoresection, a big tumor right next to nerve, and was desperate to keep his vision because he was a fanatical golfer. And you all know the golfers really don't want to stop playing golf. They do anything to keep playing golf. And um, so he had an endoresection, and I heard from his ophthalmologist in Australia. He still had very good vision in that eye. This was the first patient I treated by endoresection in 1988. I had treated him with laser and sent him referred him back to his ophthalmologist, and his ophthalmologist sent him back to me, and he said, you haven't finished the job, there's still tumor there. He was a friend of mine, still is. And uh, I, um, I said, that's just scar tissue, but he didn't believe me, and so I did an endoresection to prove to him that it was just scar tissue. I was very successful, and, um, and now it's become um, performed in a, a more centers. It wasn't called endoresection then, but then I decided to, to call it that, and it's, the name has stuck. Here's a patient with a tumor in his only seeing eye, and uh, he did very well with endoresection until he got a neovascular membrane several years later with some loss of vision. One important discovery, a sad discovery, was there was a case report of a, we, we used to do a, a fluid gas exchange to flatten the retina. But then there was a patient in South Africa who got a air embolism through the vortex vein and died. So now we use heavy liquid to flatten the retina and we don't use air. It's interesting that that happened because we did over 100 patients and never saw the problem. But we were only doing juxtapapillary tu tumors, small juxtapapillary tumors. They perhaps were operating on a bigger tumor over a vortex vein, which we weren't doing. And Professor Jusen had a patient, and she put in lots of heavy liquid into the eye, and she kept putting more and more, and there still wasn't enough, and she concluded that the heavy liquid was going into the vortex vein. So just as well, she didn't use air. Now, endoresection is a very controversial operation because you cut the tumor into little bits, and so there are fears that you disseminate tumor around the eye and around the body. And so there are some who, who believe that you have to give neoadjuvant radiotherapy um, to prevent these problems. We seem to be getting good results without radiotherapy, but although we don't agree, we've agreed to disagree, and we still get on very well together. <laughs> With regards to the future, perhaps we'll have robotic surgery doing this kind of surgery. It's already being done with some retinal procedures. Um, as a surgeon, I'd much prefer doing the operation than leaving the pleasure to a robot to do. Does uh, ocular treatment prolong life? That's a very important question. It's been debated for centuries. I go back to books in the 18th century. It was already debated then. Well, 
In 1996, this key paper was published by a German group showing that uveal melanomas fall into two groups, those with a normal chromosome 3 and those with an abnormal chromosome 3, monosomy 3, loss of chromosome 3, partial com. If there was no loss of chromosome 3, there was no metastasis. Whereas if there was chromosome 3, nearly all patients died. If they lived long enough to develop the metastasis, they all died. So this led to the hypothesis that whatever we do to these patients makes no difference to their survival because either they're going to live because they've got a disomy 3 melanoma or they're going to die because they've got a monosomy 3 tumor and the tumor has already disseminated before the patient comes to us. But we had this patient and we observed her because at the time we believed that the treatment made no difference to survival. And for a few years she did well and then suddenly her tumor grew rapidly and seeded around the eye and we had to enucleate the eye. And at the base of the tumor, it was a low grade spindle disomy 3 melanoma. But in the apex of the tumor, the new part of the tumor, it was an aggressive epithelioid monosomy 3 melanoma. And um, sadly, the patient died of metastasis. If we had treated her when we first saw her, perhaps she would still be alive today. So that has profoundly influenced my uh, management. Before, we used to treat big tumors most urgently. But now, we treat small tumors much more urgently. Here's a patient with a small tumor near the optic disc. We wanted to observe the patient. It was conventional, but the patient declined, wanted to have the eye removed. We said, why? You know, it's a small tumor. But the patient insisted, we removed the eye. And then histologically, the tumor was going all around the optic nerve. And it was going almost all the way through the sclera. It was much more extensive than the ophthalmoscopy suggested. And here are several patients with tiny tumors. And all these patients have, have died of, of metastasis. So in some patients, the tumor spreads early, some patients late. You don't know which patients it's going to happen to. So there's a move to treat these patients more urgently. To try to understand these questions, we need big data on thousands of patients followed up for 40, 50, 60 years until they've all died of old age or metastasis and so on. And thanks to the IRIS registry and other IT systems, this is going to be possible and I expect it's going to be routine and we'll have some answers one day. But to treat small tumors, you need early detection. And unfortunately, many patients are detected late. We did a study in Britain with uh, almost 2,500 patients and 23% of patients with symptomatic patients who, who presented with symptoms reported that their tumor was missed when they first presented, even though they had symptoms. And those patients were much more likely to have, to have a nucleation. So there's a big epidemic of failed detection going on with bad results. And with new technology, we've got new opportunities to detect these tumors much earlier. But the smaller the tumor, the more difficult it is to diagnose, the more difficult it is to distinguish between a large nevus and a small melanoma. Before, we just relied on ophthalmoscopy. Now, we have ophthalmoscopy, color photography, accurate follow-up. We have uh, OCT to see the retinal detachment. We have autofluorescence to see the lipofuscin, which is a very important sign for malignancy. So the diagnosis has become much easier, and biopsy, which I'll speak about. The problem is that it's very difficult to diagnose these tumors or intraocular tumors because there are many different kinds of tumor and each kind of tumor has got many different manifestations and they're all very rare. And you might study all this when you're training, but you quickly forget, it's difficult to remember all this. And the problem is that if you lo look at a textbook, you don't know what page to open unless you know the diagnosis because of the way the tumors are organized. And you can't find a diagnosis unless you know what page to open. It's a catch-22 kind of situation. And therefore, I've developed this online atlas which organizes tumors from the 
clinician's perspective according to their location and their color. And it's available on the internet free of charge, but you need to get a password to go into it. There were too many robots entering it. So the moment we need our human minds to perform the pattern recognition, but soon it will all be automated. We already have these Google cameras and you take a picture of a flower and it tells you what flower it is, or a restaurant and it tells you whether the restaurant's a good restaurant or a bad restaurant. And very soon we'll have the same for ocular tumors. With regards to prognostication, before it was univariate analysis based on tumor size, and although that's reasonably good, now it's much better by combining anatomic features with histologic features and genetic features, taking the age and gender, and we've developed a tool for doing this, and prognostication is much improved. But you need to have good genetic tests. Before, it was karyotyping, which was not very good, and then fish, which was better, but still not good enough, and then MLPA, which is much better, and in the States, they believe in gene expression profiling, and now we're using um, next generation sequencing, which takes, there's lots of new mutations being, being discovered all the time. One of these, BAP1 uh, deletion is a really important uh, mutation, very highly predictive of metastasis, sometimes inherited. So things are really advancing rapidly. But light microscopy, when I started, had changed very little over the previous 100 years or so. But during my time working in oncology, there's been a, the introduction of immunohistochemistry to allow it, make it much easier to identify melanoma cells and to distinguish them from other cells. And now I can even d detect uh, BAP1 deletions using immunohistochemistry, and, and that's got great predictive power. Before, we used to get histology when we remove the eye or remove the tumor. Now, the biopsy techniques have improved so dramatically that we can biopsy tumors less than one millimeter thick, very reliable, reliably, and they can tell us if it's a melanoma and if it's a dangerous melanoma or not. In the future, we'll probably be using liquid biopsies where we get a blood sample. And here's a patient I treated recently with a metastasis from lung, and the chemotherapy didn't work. And then they got a blood sample. They looked at the tumor DNA in the blood and identified the mutation and changed the treatment according to that mutation, and the tumor has resolved, and the patient's doing much better. And we'll be doing that with melanomas one day. With regards to screening for metastasis, before we were used to palpate the abdomen, do a chest X-ray and a blood test, which are all useless unless you're detecting terminal illness. And here's a textbook promoting all these techniques. Sadly, it was published in 2012, and it is the book that is used by all trainee ophthalmologists in the United States, and they're still being trained to perform these useless tests. Whereas now, we rely on liver imaging, ultrasound or MRI, which is much more sensitive. So you pick up the metastasis earlier, there's much better chance of entering patients into clinical trials, and, to, and one of these days they'll prolong life. With regards to treatment for metastasis, before it was chemotherapy, which made the patient very ill, but very rarely worked. And then there was targeted therapy, which didn't usually work, and liver targeted ter ter therapy, partial hepatectomy, which worked very well in some patients. And now there's lots of excitement with um, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, antibodies that suppress the suppressor T lymphocyte so that the killer T lymphocytes are free to kill the tumor. And here's a patient of mine with ocular metastasis from a skin melanoma, the metastasis in the choroid and in the conjunctiva and the caruncle. And here he is a year later following the treatment with these immune checkpoint inhibitors. The metastases have gone away. You can see the caruncle, it's now clean again. And the tumors have regressed very nicely. They work very well in some patients with cutaneous melanoma, but they don't work with uveal melanoma because the uveal melanomas have got fewer mutations and are therefore less antigenic than the skin melanomas. But 
every few weeks there's an exciting new treatment with tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, infusions, and other things. So I'm quite confident in the next few years we will have a systemic treatment that will work for liver metastasis. And when that day comes, we'll probably start treating the ocular metastasis, the ocular, the primary uveal melanoma systemically and using radiotherapy and laser treatment and excision as a secondary treatment just to consolidate the systemic treatment. That's what we do with retinoblastomas, with retinal lymphomas, at least with UCSF, with uveal metastasis, we treat systemically and then with ocular treatment. Before, we used to focus on treating the tumor. And now, we focus on treating the patient, not forgetting the family as well. And by making sure that we've got um, good emotional support with nurses, psychologists, uh, good information sharing, we give them a chance to ask questions, we answer the questions, a more consensual treatment. Um, the quality of life of these patients, uh, I feel, has improved an awful lot. And we've been done a study recently on one and a half thousand patients, and the black means a bad quality of life, and there's very few patients who report a bad quality of life after treatment for uveal melanoma. It's much worse being unemployed or um, having poor general health or having poor social support. Um, so these things are really, really important. And on the right, you can see a graph comparing the quality of life in our patients with the quality of life in the adult US general population. And uh, it's within normal limits. Uh, well, there's a dip here for emotional well-being, and that's because patients are afraid about, the about metastasis, metastatic disease, because they know that at the moment the, the treatment's not very effective. So the quality of life of these patients has improved, and it's good. And finally, there's the patient power. Patient power, previously, patients were all alone. They never heard of a nigh melanoma. They never met anyone with a uveal melanoma. They were totally isolated. Whereas now, thanks to the internet, there are patient organizations, Ocular Melanoma Foundation, Ocumel UK, Mel Melanoma Research Foundation, Acurin site. And so they are communicating with each other. They're learning from each other. They're finding out which center gives good treatment and which center doesn't give good treatment which center gives good informed consent, which center does not informed consent. They're campaigning so that when they go and see somebody in the, uh, to have an eye examination, they have their pupils dilated so that there's a better chance of getting the tumor detected and, and so on. So they are, the patients are getting together and they're going to drive further progress in the future and that's, that's really good. So in summary, we've looked at change over the past 33 years since I started working in ocular oncology. It's amazing how so many things have not just progressed, but they've changed. And we're doing the opposite now of what we used to do uh, only 33 years ago. And there's, there's lots of uh, new developments coming our way thanks to computers, uh, information technology, artificial intelligence, robotics. Uh, uh, very exciting times. But one thing that never changes is the need for us to do everything we can not to harm our patients. As you can see from this talk, um, we're harming our patients more often than we would like. Uh, we've come a long way over the past 33 years in reducing the harm to our patients, but there's still a long way to go before we can achieve our aim of not harming our, our patients. But as I said, the rate of progress is accelerating. It would be wonderful to see what's going to happen, not in 33 years' time, but in, in 10 years' time. Exciting times like it lie ahead. So I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues in Liverpool and in San Francisco, my mentors, Professor Folds and Professor Lee, and my family. Thanks.